Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our session on multi-professional teams and biomedical education. Um, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianships on the lands in which we are meeting today. And we recognise um, uh, the important uh, and valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'd like to introduce my team who are all sitting here. So as I say your name, can you wave? I'm Claire Ayland, that's me. Um, Sean, Sean Walters, Famida Sonia. Um, you're being filmed at the front, so if you if you look where Dom is at the front and wave to Dom at front. Yeah. yeah. Ildiko, Neil, Ben, Hanian, and Max is online as well. So Max is joining Hello. us. Well. Ah, thank you, Max. It's good to hear you. Um, okay, so for everyone who's joining us online and also everybody who's joining us in the room, um, welcome today. I would just like, oh, we've got a pointer. Oh, technology. Let's see how this works. Oh, it does work. Um, that's great. Normally break technology. Um, so what we're talking about today is the idea of multi-professional teams in biomedical science education um, in the specific context of histology education. Now, for people who don't know what histology education is, histology is the study of the microstructure of organisms. And in our particular case, it's the microstructure of the human body. So what we have here, does this do... Yeah. On the left of the slide where we're saying uh, the past is one of the old representations of part of the human body, which is the esophagus. And that's, a, that's an, a way of representing and looking at the microstructure of the body by taking a really thin section of the body and staining it with a couple of different dyes. So they stain pink and purple. And so those dyes are called H&E. It's a really standard stain. It's used many, many times around the world every single day. But... We are in a really exciting era of histology at the moment um, where we're actually using and developing a lot more techniques. So I'm going to hand to Sean to explain the other two images. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, so when, uh, just to give a little bit of perspective, when we're talking about the past, the stain on the left in 1877 was first developed in Russia by a Russian chemist, uh, and his name was Nicholas uh, Waskowski. And so for the next 100 years, the H&E stain was used for clinical pathology to diagnose disease, to diagnose infection. Uh, and it wasn't until the 1990s with the discovery of GFP that we began to see fluorescence become a part of microscopy. And so green fluorescent protein was identified from jellyfish. And then fast forwarding to today, what would be one fluorescent protein used as a label of, um, of uh, label another protein, we now have hundreds of fluorophores. And so you can see in the present image in the middle, what would look like the esophagus today labeled with five different fluorophores. And the level of detail that you can see from using these different dyes um, becomes much more complex than what you see in the past. So the present is really um, has only been a development of the past few years, but if we get now into today, 2024, and we look towards the future, what was a few fluorophores used for in the, in the sec, um, second image, five, we can now do 100, and we're pushing the boundaries to go even further than that. So 100 different labels of different cells, of different cell markers, and with that complexity, uh, you can get to really good information about disease states and clinical diagnosis in terms of drugs that can be given for different cancers and such. The two images in the uh, middle and the right are uh, cancerous tissue in the esophagus. So the future is now using AI, and it's a catchy model to say things about AI. We've all used chat TTP, but we can use deep learning models to take all of this information and get real meaningful data out of it. So we can count the amount of cells, we can see the spacing between the cells, and we can use these AI models to look at hundreds of different tissue sections and get all the complexity that can be pulled from it in a very quick manner using supercomputer clusters. So this is the future that we believe is gonna happen and, and starting to pass this on to students at UQ is important to us. 
Thank you, Sean. So I hope what you've seen from what Sean was just describing there is that histology, um, until relatively recently, was actually quite a simple discipline. You had the H&E stain and that was what you needed to interpret. But now it's becoming in clinical practice and in research practice a very, very exciting and very rapidly developing field. And that is what we need to be um, talking to our students about, and that's what we need to be teaching our students. But it's getting to the point now that the complexity is so great that one single person is really not going to be able to do that. And so what we're uh, talking about today is the idea of multi-professional teams in teaching. So worldwide, interprofessional education is acknowledged as one of the ways in which we can get really good outcomes when we're teaching students. So you teach students, say medical students, nursing students, physiotherapy students together, and they're going to work as a team. And this reflects the upcoming uh, professional practice that these students will be doing once they graduate. They'll be working in large teams. But Getting true interprofessional education to occur at a university is very difficult because you've got really big concerns about timetabling, venues, um, linking all of the curricula together. And so by using a multi-professional teaching team for your students, rather than um, trying to mix your student groups together, uh, we can get some of the benefits of that interprofessional education. So a multi-professional team for us is a team that's formed with people who have diverse professional backgrounds and experiences, but importantly, we're all collaborating to achieve a common goal. Each member contributes their own unique expertise, but and members work together, but they maintain their own distinct identities within that team. And they will also respect each other's unique capabilities, but they'll also acknowledge their own strengths and weaknesses. And the World Health Organisation has uh, stated that interprofessional education is very important. Um, it occurs when two or more professionals learn about, from and with each other to enable effective collaboration and improve health outcomes. And that's basically what we're trying to do here. Now, multidisciplinary approaches work. Two very quick examples of this. Um, the first one is the deciphering of the script Linear B. Linear B is a very early form of written Greek, and it wasn't a linguist or a historian that deciphered it. It was an architect. So it was someone who was coming, Michael Ventris, from very um, outside of that particular field. And similarly, how leopards get their spots, the idea of how we can explain mathematically how animals get the various pigmentation patterns they do from the interaction of chemicals within their skin. And that work was pioneered by Alan Turing, who was a code breaker and a computer scientist and not, nothing at all like a biologist. So we know that multidisciplinary approaches work. And I'll hand over to Neil now to talk about one that's a little bit closer to histology. Well, this is all uh, quite contemporary. Uh, the uh, image on the uh, lower left is a connectome. That's a wiring diagram of the uh, connections between uh, uh, neurons, nerve cells, and uh, their contacts, uh, synapses, uh, in a brain. In uh, this case, the uh, uh, fly brain. So the, on the lower left, we have uh, uh, small uh, triangular structures which represent nerve cells, and the uh, wiring is in the uh, background. On the uh, right, the uh, larger picture is, gives us a uh, closer look at uh, the uh, arrangement. The triangular structures variously colored are nerve cells, and the web-like arrangement in the uh, background is the uh, wiring uh, in between. Uh, that's, a, a, that's just uh, uh, trim things down to the 50, 50 largest uh, nerve cells. This uh, uh, flyer wire uh, project, uh, which we're um, uh, looking at, uh, began with uh, a, a with diverse collaboration between diverse multi multidisciplinary teams, uh, ranging from uh, neuroscientists to computer scientists uh, to, uh, of all people, online uh, gamers. The, um, the the subject on the upper uh, left is the um, 
humble uh, fruit fly, uh, which turned out to be uh, surprisingly uh, uh, suitable uh, for this uh, project. It has a wide range of uh, quite complex behaviours, including uh, walking, uh, flying, uh, uh, navigation, uh, sensory perception, uh, social uh, interaction, uh, learning uh, simple uh, tasks and uh, memory. This is all powered by a brain uh, with, uh, uh, 50, with 140 nerve cells and 50,000 uh, uh, connections. Uh, the, uh, the fly, surprisingly, uses the same neurotransmitters as we have, uh, d uh, dopamine, uh, glutamate, and uh, acetylcholine. Uh, 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 they, um, they can be kept awake with uh, coffee. They're prone to uh, addiction. Um, they experience loneliness and uh, age as uh, we do. The... Um, the uh, multidisciplinary uh, project, uh, which we've uh, covered, has enhanced our understanding of the uh, human uh, uh, brain. Uh, the, um, this, uh, this immense step was accelerated to the extent of 50,000 person years by AI. Uh, we now have... Uh, uh, we now the up until now the human brain seemed hopelessly complex, but we now have the prospect of an atlas of uh, the human brain, and uh, the uh, from this we might uh, we can hope to get the insights we need for targeted therapies uh, for uh, diseases like uh, uh, like autism, uh, addiction, depression. Uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Neil. So again, what Neil is demonstrating here is that histology um, is rapidly becoming incredibly complex and we're moving past one person being able to do this and we're needing many professionals to be involved in these projects. And this is obviously research, um, but this is the kind of thing that we need to be preparing our students for um, through our teaching of histology. Okay, so I'm going to get Haney in to come up and uh, take you through this bit. Great, thank you. So um, I'm going to be taking us through the next few slides with Max, who's on Zoom with, with us. Um, together, Max and I are both third-year medical students at UQ, so part of the multidisciplinary part of this teaching team. And um, this is something that we're quite passionate about because we went through this as a student not very long ago, faced with a picture like this in our first class, having to try and work out what's going on. So I invite you as a little exercise to have a think about what you can get out of this image, especially if you don't have a background in medical sciences. But if you do, pretend that you are your first, first time looking at this. Um, does anyone have any thoughts? Is it quite daunting to sort of make out what this could be? Probably quite daunting at the start, um, which is what we all think as well. So <laughs> yeah, if you think that, it's, um, it's totally understandable. And so um, what we have found going through learning, the process of learning this sort of um, skill is that we have to try and take something that is quite complicated, like looking at this, and try and describe what it is that we are doing in order to break it down and make it a little bit easier. So as an exercise, do you mind if we move to the next slide? We um, then move towards looking at things that maybe are a little bit more familiar. So now if we try the same exercise, um, could we ask for any sort of thoughts on what you see on this image? Want to just say anything at all? Yeah, we discussed when we look at this picture, the big question, are we looking at the sunset, for example, or a sunrise? That's quite a unique perspective. Have you been on the beach recently in the morning or in the afternoon? My, may influence your answer. Anyone else want to say and anyone online, is there anyone online who'd like to say anything about what you're seeing there? What is it that you're seeing there? 
Um, it looks like a landscape, so you can see distinct components of it, trees, shrubbery, uh, fields, maybe lavender fields, organization of the landscape, and then the mountains in the distance. And then the sky, it was already sunrise or sunset. But you can see distinct units that are building as a whole, the, the image here, maybe. Thank you so much. Any other thoughts? Is this a country you recognize? Is this Australia? To me, it feels like a French countryside, although I've never looked, been in France and <laughs> would have no clue, but it feels like that. Yeah, I'm Hungarian, and this picture could be absolutely the Hungarian countryside as well. <laughs> Amazing. So I think all of those are wonderful responses. And like we do this with the students now um, sort of routinely at the start of the histology teaching every year, actually. And we get them to answer the same question. And we get some response like, like that, which is wonderful. The next question we then ask them is to say, why is it that you've made that conclusion? How do we know, for instance, that it's either the morning, the dawn, or the sunset? How do we know that there's shrubbery? Like, what is the reason for you describing these things as such? Does anyone want to add on to what they said before and give us sort of what you think is the reason? Or why it's France? You. Oh, yes. Uh, what about the color? Is it important? Because we, we for example, hematic saline and you seen. We can distinguish between, uh, for example, the nucleus and the cytoplasm. I think the color also is, is very important, you know, to identify and uh, to differentiate between different type of tissue. Yes, I think so, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah, like the color, I think that goes with the sunset as well. Like the, you can see a, a yellow circle that probably resembles the sun and it's not so high in the sky and so bright that it's midday. It's probably at the start, at the end. I think that goes in really well with the color. Um, any other thoughts before we sort of move on from this? Yeah. Oh. No, sorry, just an online response saying um, from previous exposure to them, I'm assuming it um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm interpreting that as if, if you've already experienced a French countryside or know what that kind of looks like, you can associate that with the picture that you're seeing. Thanks so much. That's so true and actually goes with one of our ideas of like schemas and past um, events forming a new conception. So, yes. I was going to ask, how do you interpret, why are you interpreting those as trees or shrubs? Um, just the three dimensions of them. So my life experience, a tree tends to be higher than a shrub, but you could have quite a profound maze or shrub-like appearance. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. And yes, Sean as well. I can't help but going down to the details. So it looks like a garden bed in the front to me. And that's why I thought France, because I'm envisioning um, grapes and a vineyard and um, a place to go for wine tasting. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Oh, yes, Ahmed. Uh, thank you. I would say there is the, some sizes and shapes are important here, beside the color. And the spaces occupied by the trees or other parts, lands, that are also important. Amazing. Yeah, looking at, like we talked about, colors, sizes, dimensions, proportions, lots and lots of things that we're really engaging with in terms of describing this visual picture with our words and logically thinking about them and making conclusions, similar to what we might have to do with the histology picture, just as a preamble to that. Then what we tend to do when we ask the students this is then we consider a third question, which is, can we see anything else? Have we missed anything? Are there anything else in this picture that is... Sort of talking, Famit has got an idea. Did you have your hand up? Sorry. No, no, no. I oh, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. There's straight lines in this. And I don't usually associate straight lines with nature. <laughs> yeah, so maybe there's an element of like comedy or some sort of, you know, um, synthetic prescribing about this, this picture. 
Um, but yeah, and then for me, things like, you know, there's a mountain and a horizon. Is it the ocean at the back? Something like that. Um, this is quite a thorough exploration of a picture and um, is three questions that we tend to use in a sort of subset of teaching strategies called visual thinking strategies, um, something that Max and I have learned from various places, but just found that it's actually very applicable for helping students who might not be acquainted with histology to actually start engaging with histology. So if we move on to the next slide, we will return to then our, our slide, and I won't mention yet what organ it is, but is it possible for you to then have a think about this slide in the same manner, even if you don't know what we're looking at? Um, if we imagine things like looking at splotches of round things that are a little bit more purple in color, perhaps on a background of something that's a bit more red, pink in color. Um, and from here, we're able to start um, sort of talking to the students about describing these. So we call these sort of, firstly, we say this is actually part of the spleen. And then we have white pulp and red pulp. And, and now it starts to make sense why these names are ascribed, even if we don't know exactly what makes them up. And then we start thinking, okay, we haven't, we've probably missed the fact that there are some little white spaces in the background that are just a lot of dots. And so maybe these are actually formed not by a purely solid structure, but lots of little cells that are just in many, um, great in number and forming the background. And then you're looking and seeing there's some white spaces. And we're thinking, okay, are they sort of, the lumens or are they the, the middle of pipes like blood vessels and finally Claire was mentioning about straight lines we see straight lines at the side and we think what's going on with that our organs usually straight um rather is it a cut that we've made um or an artifact or something like that so this is just a little demonstration to take us through an exercise that Max and I have been working on getting students to do usually at the start of their studies um Firstly, to show that in terms of interdisciplinary um, teaching and involvement, even skills like analyzing artwork and um, starting to describe them can be hugely applicable in terms of the foundations of understanding histology. Um, and secondly, just to mention as well that from a student tutor point of view, in terms of being part of that multidisciplinary team, we have... I suppose a special focus in terms of helping things to become accessible to students and helping students to feel like they are comfortable with understanding things that they might previously be really daunted about just because we were there not long ago. Is there anything you would like to add, Max? I'm sorry, I should have let Max give more of his pearls of wisdom as we were talking. I think the one thing which you have sort of... Um... I think already touched on, which is quite uh, fascinating, is that in the previous example, when we were looking at this artwork of, you know, a field and the sky and such, that sometimes it's quite a amusing question of asking, you know, why do you think that is a tree or why do you think that is a shrub or even just as simple as why do you think that is a field? And with that, you know, there comes a very broad range of experience that we've all had and some of us may have actually seen fields like that before or maybe seen images like that before and I think that's what one of the students here in the chat mentioned is that previous exposure is one of those big things. And when we go into histology, it's such a new and foreign experience for many students that trying to come down to the very basics of, okay, what do you see? Why do you think that is what you are seeing? And what more can you see? Really draws us back to the foundation of picking out those individual aspects and then linking that together with knowledge that we then uh, begin to build up throughout our teaching. And I think the really important thing is when you're in something that is so foreign and so new, but there are different perspectives that can change how you see it. Having a teaching from a multidisciplinary team approach really helps because you get all of those different experiences, all of those different understandings of a slide, and that builds up a much more sort of comprehensive understanding. 
Yeah, amazing. And that just reminded me as well that the comment about the time of day, that was one that was quite interesting when we thought about histology as well. Um, Max was mentioning sort of some of the different features, but that the slides are changing in time and look different in different states and um, even in normal physiology. And that was another thing we were able to emphasize with the students, which is really fun. So I hope you enjoyed that and um, get a little bit of idea then about how we can use that as uh, tutors. Yes, Joan. Oh, I'll give you the mic. Not sure whether I'm allowed to ask a question now. It might come across as challenge. Um, there's a fundamental difference between interpretator uh, artwork and a histology. In the artwork you just show, there's a personal perceptions, uh, your own experience uh, and a preference are all incorporated into your interpretation. But with a histology, you interpret uh, the fact as you say it, as the point Max made, if you don't have pre-exposure, you, you can't make any associations. So, you know, I can say that's a vasculature, but if you never seen a vasculature on a HE, you, you can't say that's a tree, not a shrub, that sort of thing. So how do you overcome that sort of a challenge? Sure, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I think I'll just um, answer that one and then hand it over to Sean there. Um, how do you think people learn to identify what shrubs and trees are in the beginning? Because at some point in our life, we have no knowledge of what a tree or a shrub is. What we're trying to do with this in histology is actually give people tools that they can use to find elements within the image. So rather than seeing a huge image, which is all completely new and completely foreign to them, they're actually starting to say, I can, I can see what this element is. I can describe this element. And even if they're not telling you, they, they aren't able to tell you what, um, what organ it is, you can still pull out a huge amount of information based on the simple appearance of the tissue. And that's actually a fundamental skill in histology and radiographic anatomy and a whole lot of things. The visual disciplines, the ability to extract meaning, visual literacy, ability to extract meaning from an image in that way. So we're actually at that very first part of teaching students the beginning, the first words, the first letters that they're going to use in their literacy. Sean. And I believe that this is a very important skill to go to the next level. So if we could go back to the picture image just for a moment. Uh, one more back. So imagine if you could, that you could identify the species of every tree there. And you could look at every leaf that's on every tree and know what that is. And then go down to an even further level and be able to say which tree or shrub there is on its way to death and how old it is and what its current state biologically is, wouldn't you want to know? And so when you expand to the future of histology and you get into molecular histology, you begin to take this image and you've begun to expand on the amount of information possible and go to a, such a high level of detail that um, it's almost um, you can really specifically answer everything that you may want to answer there if you just ask the right question. So if we fast forward to the fluorescent image, here is an example of your esophageal, um, a esophagus um, biopsy from a human who has cancer. We've labeled it with five different labels and we've utilized fluorescence to be able to label different cells. And this is just a simple example in the research environment of looking at um, five different markers. And what we're trying to look at is how complement receptor is involved in inflammation and part of the cancer. Um, and so if we go to the next image, which comes closer, you, if you take the same skills that you applied to the H&E um, section and to the picture that we saw and apply it here, you could ask yourself, well, what do we see? Well, in the blue, we're looking at nucleus. And then in the green, we're looking at um, cells that are coming to a certain area that um, are part of uh, the complement receptor cascade. And then we're looking at extracellular proteins that are in red. And so if you begin to start to analyze it, you can start to say, well, what are the distances between cells that are labeled green cells and the red? What is the distance between how many um, nuclei are there? Can we count them all? And you get into real a level of detail that um, 
is much greater than what you would see, I guess, in the H and E. Even though the H and E slide section uh, provides an immense amount of detail too. So we use uh, AI then to help us out because if I were to count all these cells and sit there with a counter, it would be very tiresome, and my finger would probably go numb by the time I finished counting them. And so, and then. For complex phenotypes, where one cell is expressing two types of markers, so it might have um, a real distinct phenotype, how would you be able to classify that? So what we have is uh, learning models using a supercomputer that would then go through and count it. So if I can go to the next slide, what we do is an image segmentation. So you're looking on the left. Um, a fluorescent image that has five colors. And on the right, where the um, deep learning model has classified each one of the cells. And so, and this is where a human is very important because you've got to tell it what to do. You've got to say what the phenotypes are. So let's say I want a phenotype where I want a green cell and a red cell, or I want a magenta cell and a green cell. When you begin to think of the combination of phenotypes, there are quite a lot. And so if you look, the total number of cells are there, are 5,121. You can see that in the top left corner. You can get the amount of cells that are fluorescent for single uh, markers and negative cells and such. So you can see all the types of information that is given and come out with percentages of cells to the entire image. What's amazing is that this was done in a matter of seconds. Once it was trained, it was able to do it in, in very rapidly. And I was able to do uh, something like 100 different sections in probably, I guess, an hour or two. It comes to the point where the amount of data is really robust and you start to really be able to make um, important correlations to disease states. So the idea here is to come up with mechanisms to be able to identify cancers, how they're behaving, using histology, and come up with actually drug treatments. So I'm giving, while this might look complex, I'm giving a very simple example because in our current day and age, we can do a hundred different labels. So imagine a hundred different um, uh, labels here and cells might have 50 of those, one cell might have 50 of those labels marked. And so the complexity coming into the future is so exciting for histology. It's almost like a renaissance period at the moment with microscopy and histology coming together. And um, I'm a very excited for uh, clinical medicine too. Great, thanks, Sean. So what you're seeing here is that the advances in histology that are being made in the research fields is really giving a lot more information than we could ever have pulled out of the H&E sections. But it's also getting to the point where not, not a single one of us humans could actually do that. We'd actually need a big team in order to extract and make sense of this information. Um, so... We just want to pass to Ben very quickly here to say, what is it in our perspective that makes these multi-professional teams work? Uh, so I hope you take away some learning uh, or some inspirations as to in our specific examples, there are a few things that make a multidisciplinary team work in teaching specifically. So the first thing is, as we are educators, we want to bring subject matter expertise and skills and then pedagog pedagogical expertise and skills and the professions, because it's a multidisciplinary team, the profession must be relevant, but I think the relevance can be broad and the diversity is really essential, so everybody bring their own perspective. But at the, at the end, uh, we need to do something for the students and we need to have common and shared and agreed goals. And that can be in terms of learning objectives or you know, learning outcomes or anything that's on paper or that's not, not on paper, essentially. To work as an effective team, and this can be applied to many other settings as well, open communications, open-minded, being willing to learn, change and adapt, enthusiasm and passion always will help uh, in everything we do. And as a team, we need to have team players that will model future collaborations. And especially when we do medical students teaching, as Claire have preambled before, we would have multidisciplinary a team working together. So that's sort of uh, modeling and authenticity uh, that mirrors the real world as well. And regards to pedagogical expertise, we need to have effective teaching techniques uh, such as storytelling. And therefore, a member, a lot of us are engaged in gaining these uh, teaching techniques from formal or informal mentoring and training. And all of these expand, extends beyond just the student contact and student facing in the classroom. 
uh, all of us are participating in the uh, curriculum design and assessments, and that would help us gain skills as well. And also respect and trust for professional differences, should there be anything that arise, and also cultural uh, differences when uh, we work as a team. And lastly, we need to have trainings and just to make sure that everybody would be on the same page and uh, to make everyone work effectively together. Okay, great, thanks. Now, how do you make a successful team? How do you make and use a successful team? One of the things that I'd like to say here, I think leadership, not, not a lot of the team so much, but leadership within your school or your faculty and recognising that multi-professional teams are really important for teaching. Um, so, Ildi, you want to come up? So, we've got a couple of quotes here just for you to think about. Um, the first one is that successful teaching and learning experiences within professionality help students to understand their own professional identity while gaining an understanding of the roles of other professionals on the team. It's really not going to be happening in the future that people work solely within their own discipline, their own profession. And if you want advice on when to do this, you're offering into professional learning before students begin to practice their own profession. And that builds in them a basic value of working within interprofessional teams. Il, do you want to say anything? Uh, well, just to give a specific example for our teams that Neil and I represent um, veterinary, veterinarians and that we, we bring pathology, although it's not human pathology, we use animal slides. So Neil and I can a little bit guide the students and um, what's normal and what's abnormal in the animal slides and help them to interpret lesions, for example, because don't forget that many students will go down the research path and they'll work with animal tissues. So making them understand early on that there is major differences between animal tissues and human tissues and ha they have to learn to extrapolate information from animal tissues to human disease is important. Few examples that came up specifically is when we look at the respiratory system, so they understand when they looked at the mice and rat uh, bronchial tissues that the bolt is constitutive in lab animals, but in humans, it, this is inducible. And if you see that amount might indicate chronic inflammation. And a fascinating example, I, uh, so it, it goes vice versa. So by teaching as a vet, I learn and I can come up with new ideas for my veterinary students. And one example is, which is, I don't know if you're aware of it, but you introduced uh, my, the concept of tumor sub, myoepithelial cells have tumor sub suppressor function in the human breast, right? As I was teaching it, I realized that we have complex and mixed tumors in dogs, a very common tumor, and they're almost always benign. And there is literally no literature on the, the tumor suppressive function of this proliferating myopithelial cells and canine tumors. So I'm about to start new student project on this. So this is, this is a very good example of interdisciplinary benefits that goes both ways. Yeah, so multi-professional teams don't just benefit students, they benefit the staff in the teams as well. Um, so I just want to get everyone to have a really quick think about this. Um, your task now is to design and deliver a virtual reality therapy program to treat people for mental health um, issues for worldwide release. What do you think you need in order to do that? Just yell out anything that you think might be relevant. Psychiatry, yep. Yeah. Psychology, yep. Yeah. Social workers, nurses, we're, we're very much onto the health professions here. Can anyone think of anything that's not a, anyone that's not a health profession? Artists, excellent, yep. Worldwide release. Maybe we need musicians, physical therapy, Online web designed statistical I, scientist. Uh, yeah, excellent statistics. That's 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 very important. Yes, to actually know whether what you've delivered is is actually working. Um, so about crochet, crochet something. Oh, yeah. Occ occupational therapy, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so lots and lots of different things. And we're seeing, you know, you, you have to think really outside of just healthcare at this point. You have to think about what's going to make this successful. And for worldwide release, you also have to have real insight into the different cultural um, aspects of, of trying to release a program worldwide. So you probably want people who are um, know about the various cultures in different parts of the world and also the languages in different parts of the world to make it successful. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Computer scientists. Yeah. So um, this is our team here. So we all teach histology. As we've said, Neil and Ildi are pathologists, veterinary surgeons. Um, some of us are scientists, come from a research background. We've also got um, people who are coming from a music and speech and drama background, which is actually very important for teaching. Um, we've got Sean, who comes with the technical expertise. Um, we've got Hanian and Max and Ben, who come with the, the peer and near peer um, perspective. We've got people who've got pedagogical expertise. And finally, we've also got, we're teaching human medical students, by the way, um, we've got human medical doctors in there as well. But rather than being uni professional and only having medical doctors teaching medical students, we've got this huge, great team here, which allows us to really um, bring all of these strengths together to address the needs of the students in teaching histology. Now, I've got another activity for you as well. Here, you've been asked, now imagine in your own particular circumstances, you've been asked to develop an educational resource for online learning. And this resource is going to be shared between several different schools at UQ. And try and pick your school and something that's very different. So if you're in the School of Medicine, for example, maybe think about law or humanities or something like that. And it'll contribute to several different programs of study. And in addition to presenting content, it'll also be used for summative assessment. And at the moment, you've got very little design experience. So you, you really haven't done much in the way of designing online resources. What would you do? How would you go about doing this? Would you try and do it all, of, all yourself? Anybody can say anything? Okay, so you go to Italy because Italy's got what? what? What's the expertise that Italy brings? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're bringing the expertise in online design, e-learning, pedagogy, but they're not going to bring disciplinary expertise, are they? So would you need to reach out to the other schools involved? and find other people in there? Yeah? Anything else you think you'd need? Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Yes, project management. So something like this, this is, this is quite a big activity to do. So you need all of the parts of your team all working together. So you need someone to actually keep everybody going in the same direction, don't you? And... Another activity just to get you thinking about this, think about your own teaching activity at the moment. Do you have a problem area? Is there some area which isn't working properly in your teaching at the moment for whatever reason? Could you use a multi-professional teaching team to give you the creativity for doing it? Does anyone want to be brave and volunteer a problem area? Well, we've got something online. Um, someone saying, yeah, definitely need to have a team. You wouldn't want to try and do it all yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I do a bit of teaching at the moment in a neuroanatomy um, course, which is also biomedical. We are marking an assignment which has proved quite difficult to mark because it has quite a few clinical sort of correlates with anatomy that we as people that are not yet clinicians actually find very difficult to know the right answer about sometimes. So I think I can see in that problem the need for people with clinical experience. And in fact, that, that seems to be a common thing in a lot of medical teaching as well. We struggle sometimes to find people with clinical background to be able to tell us more definitively uh, about that sort of um, concept. Yeah. 
Is anyone else gonna? Yep. Uh, I would say because uh, when I did my PhD that time, we we are uh, working with some Carl background, so there is some problem with I think the, some language barrier. So how do you address as a multi-professional team to address the language barrier? Okay, so that's a good question. How do you deal with the fact that your students and your staff come from a number of different countries, linguistic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds? I think that's actually one of the big strengths of our histology team, that it is so diverse. Um, and I think that is also really important for the students to see that there's diversity there. Um, and one of, the, one of the things, the big things that I would really suggest at this point is really good communication and really good respect for other members of the team. So if there is a language issue there, you are open about communicating about that language issue rather than being critical about it. And you're respecting the fact that this person that may have some sort of language issue is actually bringing a lot of skills and expertise in um, and you, you need to promote that as well. So I think that's a really... Um, the other thing I'd say about that is I would actually almost use that as a learning point for your students because your students at some point are going to be in a team where there are going to be cultural differences, there are going to be linguistic differences, they need to be able to work in a team successfully. So modelling that kind of professional behaviour um, in your teaching team I think is really key for modelling it for your students. I would just actually like to give one example here, Haney, and I'm going to call you out on this one. Um, I had a problem area with the histology tutors trying to train the histology tutors into thinking about what facilitation was in teaching. Rather than just giving a lecture, how do you facilitate teaching? And Hanian has a background in music and singing, and in one of our training sessions, we got Haney in to actually teach us to sing. And that's a really different technique, but it, it was a very, very eye-opening technique because firstly, he's an excellent teacher, great facilitator. We were all working together in it. We were all doing something we were a little bit uncomfortable with doing. And we were all students at that point. So it was giving us real insight into how students felt when you put them on the spot and you ask them, what's that thing on the slide over there? We're asking the same thing of us as tutors, come on, do some singing. But it was really, really useful. So um, I think that was one little problem area that we were able to use our multi-professional skills in addressing solely within our team itself. So I think what I'm trying to say here is that try and be really creative about this. Don't just think, oh, I'm in science, therefore I can only use scientists. You think, I'm in science, what can humanities help me with? What can I help humanities with? And those disciplinary um, collaborations that are really outside of your own area, I think are the ones that lead to the really good creative solutions for problems. Yep. Okay, now we're almost at the end, so i just like to invite my tutors to think who's the next superhero that's going to join our superhero team? Can anyone think of any other members of our team that would be very useful? More near peer tutors. Okay, thanks, Ben. Yep, I, I agree with that. I think that's really important. Yep. I think given given what Sean's been talking about today with the future of research histology coming into clinical practice and the need to prepare our students for it, I'm thinking that um, developmental biologists, molecular biologists, geneticists are actually going to be important in that as well. Anyone else suggest anything? Yep. So thank you for nice, actually it's a nice and innovative presentation, but not regarding the next member. I would say something about the future plans. Uh, I have a question that is no doubt that is our uh, inter membership is very important for medical education, but did you do any survey or measurement to see the effectiveness of this multi team? Or do you have any future plan to do this? 
Um, okay, so measuring the success of your teaching is, um, I think, somewhat, somewhat tricky. So you can go for things like, um, you can look at student performance on examinations. And that's 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 can be a good indicator of how well students have really understood it. You can look at formal feedback that students have given you. You can look at informal feedback that students have given you, or you could design an instrument yourself to look at this. Um, doing this within the current medical program is, I think, a little bit tricky because it's such a huge program, and um, it's difficult to try and isolate. Um, specific elements of it and how they're contributing to student success or student satisfaction within the course. Um, however, we do get formal and informal feedback from the students which indicate that they really do value um, the contributions of, of the near peer tutors. They really do value the contributions of our vet science um, tutors, our pathologists. Um, and Sean, who gave a, a talk earlier this year got a huge amount of really positive feedback. They loved that. Um, so in terms of that kind of feedback, yes, we are getting the feedback and we're able to look at student um, achievement on examinations and student achievement on assessment to say, yes, they're, they're doing okay on that as well. So our approach is working. Um, we are... I, I, I know what you're saying because when we when I first started this and started saying it's really important to have vets on our team, um, I, I did get a lot of pushback from people who said, but you're teaching medical students, why would you need vets? And the answer to that I would say, and this is something that Neil is particularly, um, particularly um, very keen on, is that in the last decade, 70% of the new diseases that have arisen in humans have come from zoonotic transmission from animals. So... It's not a case that humans are in isolation anymore. Humans exist within a world, within animals, within an environment, within changing climate. And all of these things play into human health. And they, we really need to bring those into um, the education. Um, and also the fact that our medical students are no longer going to be working in teams only of doctors, human doctors. They're often going to be working in these really large, multi-professional, multicultural, multi-country teams. And that's why I think it's really important to have these multi-professional teams as a foundation at this early stage. Yep. Okay, would anybody else like to say anything at this point? Okay, well, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming and participating in our presentation today. I'd like to say thank you to all my wonderful tutors. We could not teach without any of you. We, we need you all. That's great. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, please do feel free to contact me. Thank you.